botulinum toxin injections like the well-known brand Botox are now so widely used they've become a norm in anti-aging skincare treatments. Used by practitioners for decades now, there don't appear to be serious long-term effects from these anti-wrinkle injections when administered appropriately by qualified medical practitioners. But that doesn't mean they don't come without risks and some unknowns. Too many injections too frequently can have unwanted effects. And new research even suggests that freezing our muscles with anti-wrinkle injections can alter our brain activity. Well, here to guide us through everything we need to know about Botox and other anti-wrinkle injections are two of my favourite aesthetic specialists. London-based Dr Chen Xu is well known to viewers of this channel and we have a new addition today. Dr Emmeline Ashley is based right here in Edinburgh and is a cosmetic physician with degrees in biology, aesthetics, dermatology and surgery. And I will link to the Instagram pages of both doctors in the description so you can find out more about them. For now, now, let's get into the discussion as we look at Botox up close. Well, Dr. Chen, it's always good to have you on the channel. Thank you very much for coming back. Hello again, Claire. With a new hairstyle, which I love. Yep. <laughs> really suits you. Um, and I'm excited to introduce Dr. Emmeline today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and letting me join you both. Oh no, absolutely, because of course we met recently when you gave me the little one-two between my brows. Right. <laughs> and uh, we realised pretty quickly that we were on the same page when it comes to anti-aging and just going for a more natural look. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I think we're all going to have a good discussion today. Um, Dr Emmeline, you live in the fabulous city of Edinburgh as I do, but tell viewers where you're originally from. So I'm originally from the States. I'm sure the accent gives it away a little bit, um, but half, half Chinese, half English. So half my family's in the UK anyway. And then I married a Scottish man who convinced me to come to Edinburgh, which I love. But that's good. You give you bring a bit of knowledge from both sides of the pond, you know, because um, uh, a lot of my viewers are from the States. So it's, it's really good to have that mix. Yeah. So um, I want to start, if we can, because uh, I know both of you have a lot of experience in delivering Botox injections. Um, Dr Chen, would you mind just reminding us how Botox works and some of the different forms? Because, of course, Botox is a brand name. We all call it Botox. But there are other makes as well, aren't there? Yeah, um, absolutely. So the reason the name Botox is stuck and everyone refers to it as Botox is because that particular brand Botox was the first ever brand to have come out um, so the actual drug name is botulinum toxin um, and there are different types so type A is the one that we commonly use and um, there's type type B C D I think all the way up to G um, but type A is the most potent type so actually what it does basically is it is a type of neurotoxin essentially I know it sounds scary but mm. um, it's that, that group of compa compounds that basically when that compound is in uh, injected into the junction between the muscles and the nerves, it blocks the, the signal from the mus from the nerve to the muscle, and it prevents the muscle from contracting. That's a, in essence, that's how it works. And this effect is temporary with Botox. It tends to last about three months or so. Mm. Um, so it's not a permanent kind of treatment. It's, um, it is a temporary treatment. And it's used a lot for um, treating or reducing the wrinkles, but only the wrinkles that are associated with certain muscle contractions. So mm -hmm. commonly the upper face, the three areas that people commonly talk about is glabella between the eyebrows, the forehead and crow's feet in the sort of corners of the eyes. Um, and it's very effective at relaxing the muscles in those areas and therefore reduce the lines, the wrinkles in that area, mm -hmm. in those areas made by the expressions. Um, there are different types uh, or different forms of botulinum toxin, different brands. Mm. So Botox is the most well-known one from America. Um, in the UK, we've also got uh, two other ones that used a lot, um, and that's Bocachor, which is from um, Germany, and then there's Azalor, which is a British brand. So okay. all of them are safe and effective. Um, they're just they're different brands. Yeah. 
And I mean, Dr. Emmeline, are there any advantages, do you think, in using one particular brand of Botox over the other? Because I think people go along to clinics and ask, you know, they ask for their Botox and they don't really know what they're getting. I mean, should we be asking what, what you're using? So I think that's a really interesting question. And it's one where the answer might even change a little bit because in the past year, we've seen quite a few new toxins mm. hit the market in the UK and be licensed for use in the UK. And they all have their unique selling points. Um, I did look into this a little bit last year and I read quite a few papers and reviews because uh, I was quite interested in the differences between the brands there because as Dr. Chen said, Botox, it's so ubiquitous. The very brand name has become completely synonymous with these types of treatments. There's a lot of incentive when new brands hit the market to try differentiate themselves. Um, so there was this really excellent review that was published in the uh, Dermatological Surgery Journal in 2018. And it just went through the current body of literature and it just tried to dispel some of the common prevailing misconceptions around the differences between toxin brands. And basically what the research showed is at the moment, there's quite a small number of studies with kind of mixed methodology. So done in very different ways to compare brands head to head, and they often give conflicting results. So one study might say Botox works better for the glabella region. So the frown area, you know, over Azalea, another study might say, oh, Azalea is actually better and it gives faster and longer results. So I don't think at the moment there's really definitive evidence to say, you know, there's a large difference between the brands and one superior to the other. Um, I think at the end of the day, you know, it's very much to do with clinical experience with certain products. Um, injectors and patients will have their own preferences. Um, and there's other factors, you know, like patient anatomy. So often the diffusion of an injection will depend on how many receptors or nerve endings are in the tissue that's being injected in terms of the field of effect, how big of a spread the Botox has. And that's brand independent. That's the patient's individual anatomy. Um, so I think all those factors play a really important role in sort of choosing the brand of toxin. So as long as it's a licensed toxin and your injector is familiar with it, you know, they're all safe to use. Yeah, and they're going to behave pretty similarly. Um, Dr. Chen, we've, we've got uh, celebrities like Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, I guess she's one of the higher profile ones, who um, was endorsing what she described as, uh, I think, a uniquely purified anti-wrinkle injection called Xeomin. You know, is there such a thing as a kind of cleaner, organic Botox? Uh, I mean, going back to this, uh, the marketing issue, you know, it's amazing what they come out with mm. in, in marketing campaigns. So it's basically Xeomine it is the American version, American brand um, mm. of Bocature that we have in the UK. It's ah. known as Bocature. Um, it's from Mertz, the, the company, the German company that produces it. So in the UK, we know it as Bocature. In the US, for whatever reason, they couldn't keep on using it as Bocature, so they had to choose another name. Um, and it's known as Xeomin in the US. So the main difference um, between Bocature or Xeomin compared to Botox, the brand, is in that it doesn't have a complexing protein. So uh the Botox brand, the actual toxin is kind of surrounded by this complexing protein, quite a large protein that's meant to protect it from being broken down. Um, and the Bocature or Xeomin is known, it's kind of marketed as a pure toxin because it doesn't have that complexing protein. Mm. Um, whether that makes a difference in the result or you know how long it lasts or whether you develop any reactions to it and you know those kind of things we I guess we don't really have enough in, enough um, evidence to show whether that actually makes a big difference but anecdotally there have been a few cases of people who have maybe become resistant to Botox for example and we think it might be because of the complexing protein and then they will switch mm -hmm. to a different toxin such as Xeomin or Bocature and um, then that's worked well for them or some you know some people because they like the idea of not having that complexing protein they choose this more kind of pure toxin and they would prefer yeah. to spoke short or zoom in so whether it's better or not i think you know it's it, i don't think it's as simple as saying this is better than that yeah. it's just different 
And if I had, like knowing that now, um, if I thought, well, I want to be like Gwyneth and I want to have the Xiomen or whatever, can I uh, call a clinic and put that request in and it's easy enough for them to source? Or do you think that clinics like to stick with the brands that they're used to using? It completely depends on the clinic. Okay. Um, I have access to what I can get any any of them. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, in my usual practice, I prefer to use Bocature because that's the one that all those years ago I trained with it um, mm -hmm. and I just sort of continued with it really. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the Bocature is like the UK equivalent of Xeomin. Yeah, um, and for people who some people that they just they love the Botox brand and they just want the Botox brand and that's all they'll have and that's fine. Yeah. So I can order that for them. So yeah. depending on the clinic, they should be able to buy all of these or you know, order all of these from somewhere. Um individual clinics might have preferences to use one over the other, but in terms of the effect and the result, they should all be equivalent as long as the doses are appropriate. Dr. Emily, in the UK, um, I don't know what the situation is in the US at the moment, but um, over here, complaints around non-surgical cosmetic procedures are at an all-time high. And in that mix, there are uh, reports of patients who've had complications after being given cheap, unlicensed anti-wrinkle injections. Are you aware of some of these products circulating? And if so, what are the kind of risks attached to them? Yeah, I see a lot of scary things on social media. Um, so in the UK, you know, we've got a big issue around lack of regulation when it comes to these types of treatments. So as an American, it was quite shocking for me when I first realized this. In the States, um, you know, administering botulinum toxin, if you're not a medical professional, that's practicing medicine without a medical license, and that's actually a criminal act. Mm -hmm. In the UK, there's no such rule necessarily. Um, so there are kind of quite strict standards around the way botulinum toxin legally, you know, is meant to be administered. So you need to be seeing a prescribing clinician face to face before you get any toxin injected. If they delegate that to someone else afterwards, even if they're not a medical professional, that that is allowed. That's that is legal. Um, but it's just something that you have to keep in mind because um, unfortunately, you know, there are people that will cut corners if they don't have if they're not prescribers, if they don't have access to prescription um, products legally. Um, so if you're if you're not seeing that prescribing clinician face to face, then by de definition, what's happening is illegal. So, and whoever you're entrusting to do your botulinum toxin injection is practicing illegally. So all those usual safety mechanisms that you would assume should be in place when handling prescription medications go out the window. You just do mm -hmm. not know what you're being injected with. Is this a legitimate product sourced from a legitimate pharmacy? There, there's no way to tell. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of these products, um, particularly you know, when used by non-medics because they're not prescribers, they're so cheap and easy to get off the internet. Mm. Um, and sometimes you'll get sort of brands like Botulax or Enotox, which are Korean um, brands. And they're, you know, there's nothing wrong with them. They're great products, but they're not licensed in the UK. Mm -hmm. So when they're being brought into the UK, again, it's not through legitimate channels and you don't know what you're getting. You could be just getting a counterfeit knockoff product. Um, so the risk is you don't know what you're being injected with. And there have been, you know, quite a few really terrible cases that have been publicized where patients have had really bad complications, mm -hmm. infections, permanent scarring. So, you know, I think it's important to, to know what the licensed brands are and, and ask your clinician, like they should be able to tell you exactly what they're injecting you with. Yeah. The issue with the Botox um, thing is that because it's been around for quite a while and it's more and more people are having it, it's less uh, less taboo and people mm -hmm. are treating it more like a beauty treatment. Um, and actually a lot of beauty therapists are doing the training and, and injecting in the UK. And most of the time, you know, it goes well, no, no problems. Um, but sometimes, like you said, you just don't know the the difficulty is or the scary thing is that those people who are not appropriately trained they don't know what they don't know so yeah. they don't know the dangers they don't know the risks because they haven't seen it and they don't know how to deal with it and sometimes they might not even know that that's a complication of what they did you know and mm -hmm. that that's the danger um and it makes them a bit 
less scared to do things and they, they can be yeah. really confident with what they do but it's 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 false confidence and, yeah. and that's a really scary thing yeah no definitely um i mean dr chen what what do you think consumers can do to protect themselves because I'm, I'm guessing cheap in itself should be a warning because we're seeing some of these online raffles and botox lotteries where you know you pay a few pounds and then you can win a package of injectables <laughs> i mean um what would you advise people do i mean no respect a respectable doctor would ever put these sort of treatments in a raffle and would do a prize draw and you know do really cheap treatments no doctor would do that no responsible doctor would do that so that already should ring alarm bells and i think you know, I, I get it. These treatments are expensive. They they are not cheap. And some people, they they probably can't afford it. And if if someone can't afford it, I think rather than going for a cheap treatment, then maybe they should look for, for safer alternatives, you know, looking after the skin really well, for example. That there are lots of things we want that we can't necessarily afford, yeah. but this is a matter of safety so it's definitely not worth taking the risk to have a cheaper treatment just to have the treatment you yeah know, it, so if they save up and have it less often but have a proper treatment rather than having it more often but paying really cheap low prices yeah no exactly because i think people well some people think that they have to go the whole way with botox and be almost like completely like mummified completely frozen and, you know, you can just have one area done and maybe have it done once a year or whatever. It's still going to have a good beneficial effect if it's, you know, line reduction that you're looking for. You don't have to go the whole hog. Obviously, the regarding the safety and how people mm. can protect themselves, I think having that initial proper consultation is really important. If they go to a clinic and they're just happy to get on with the injection because they booked in for Botox um, with no discussion about about potential side effects, any potential problems, aftercare, um, you know, explaining how it actually works and and really telling them what to expect from the treatment if there's n none of that process going on then yeah. that should ring alarm bells well that also brings us on to you know the topic of of how much is too much botox you know i mean can you take it too far have it too often um i mean coming to you dr emmeline is there a point where you would refuse to treat a patient do you think yeah so i think patients sometimes and maybe this is sort of um, our fault in the, the way that we talk about treatments and reviews, patients have this misconception that you can top up your toxin. And I have had patients come to me repeatedly to try get lots and lots of top ups. So with toxin treatments, you know, they don't kick in right away. There's that two week window where we give the botulinum toxin a chance to fully work. And then we always do a little review. And sometimes we need to do a little tweak or adjustment then um, but some patients think of that as a top up and they think if I just keep coming back every couple of weeks, maybe I can get this to just last continuously. And um, that's not how it works. So we know sort of effects of Botox and spread are, um, oh, sorry, I should say botulinum toxin are dose dependent. So you you can inject too much. You can over paralyze a, a region and have unintended paralysis of certain muscles that you don't want to hit. Um, as with any medication, we have a safe, safe license parameters under which that we were meant to use that medication um so we know that the standards are you wait three months after a treatment before you think about retreating again mm -hmm. and it would be really hard to justify breaking those parameters if you did an injection or treatment that came to any patient harm um so yeah i've definitely said no to people and said look it's too early for another treatment and um, even if you feel like you want some more we, we need to wait yeah. And when you talk about um, paralyzing muscles that you didn't intend, is that is that because I've, I've heard about systemic spread before where too much is injected and um, you get this kind of accumulation of toxin um, and then that can cause that 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 then spreads and causes uh, more problems. I mean, is that something you've heard about? It is. It's not something that is likely to happen with cosmetic Botox treatments because of the small, small doses that we use. Obviously, a botulinum toxin is used medically for quite a few other conditions. And I think there was even something recently in the in the news about patients. Um, I'd have to look it up. Um, 
it might have been in Turkey who'd had systemic issues because they'd been over injected with botulinum toxin. Um, so yes, it's something to keep in mind. And again, there are sort of safe doses in terms of the amount of units per, per kilogram of muscle mass that, that you can inject. So you just have to always keep that safety aspect in mind. Dr. Chen, do we know of any downsides to long-term use? So, you know, over and over again, so going very regularly over a long period of time, freezing our muscles. Um, ha have you seen that in your practice? The issues that I've come across with Botox um, long-term or using botulinum, to botulinum toxin long-term is not necessarily directly related to the toxin itself, mm -hmm. But it's more the fact that those patients who are having the, the toxin on a regular basis, a lot of them have not been um, properly, sort of they've not had a proper consultation, not had a very holistic consultation. So all they're having is a Botox to try to prevent their aging. But what they don't realize is that the Botox actually doesn't do anything to prevent aging of the skin. All it does is prevent wrinkles forming in certain places because it's just relaxing the muscles. So these people are having their regular toxin treatments and they're using the sunbeds and they're smoking, they're not taking care of their skin. And what happens is that after a while, the skin quality is really not good. So then when the toxin starts to wear off and the muscles start to contract, they start to get this deep like ripples of lines rather than the you know, very natural fine lines that, mm -hmm. that people get from the normal aging process. Um, and obviously they can't stand the appearance of it. So they keep on having the toxin to try to prevent the muscle contractions. And, and over time, you know, this, if you keep on making the muscles weak, they, you lose the muscle bulk and it, you then they do lose some volume in the, in the upper face where the, there's just no muscles there anymore. Um, it, it's not a good. Not good and what does that look like? Does that look like kind of divots in in the head you know so in the forehead the, the upper face area already there's not a lot of flesh there so you have basically you have your skin you have your very very thin layer of um sort of tissues under the skin and then you've got a thin layer of muscle over the forehead and then you've got bone so if you imagine not having the muscle there then you basically have skin over bone and what i've seen from a lot of people who have had uh, toxins on a regular basis over years is that you can see all the markings on their bone <laughs> and oh. and the the suture lines on the bone and it's they're literally skin over bone and it's uh, it's not a good look it's not a good look and then what happens is that sometimes when they sleep the skin can become sort of bunched up and then they start to get these vertical lines <laughs> and that can't do anything about it you know so that, i'm talking i don't want to scare people off that that's the worst case scenario well i'm giving my muscles a really good workout right now <laughs> <laughs> So, in t so that's what I mean in terms of complications long term is more that it's not necessarily a complication, but more of an undesirable long term mm. um, result from just purely relying on the toxin. So yeah. all these things, if the aim is is anti-aging, then really you, to, it's fine to use toxin, but it needs to be used as part of a holistic um, treatment regime that deals with all the different aspects of aging and not just the muscle contractions. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I mean, frequency, do you think then every three months is fine provided you're doing that? Or do you like people to kind of try and wait a bit longer? What do you normally suggest? I generally advise my clients to not have it more than twice a year. And often they'll just have it once every eight months or once a year. Really, it's good to let the muscles recover for a little mm. bit before you weaken them again. Um, and I I would actually say most of my clients now don't have toxins. They, they would really look after their skin. Mm -hmm. um, they might have it now and again if they are frowning too much, for example, because mm -hmm. actually having some facial expressions, they don't mind that. They just don't yeah. want to be frowning when they don't mean to frown. You know, yes. some people, they just even when they're reading, they're frowning. So yeah, that's why I get it because, because I just otherwise would be like that. But very similarly, I just I just do that once a year just to give myself a little bit of relaxation there, but I like to have full movement. It makes a lot of sense to me. Dr. Emmeline, what about age? Because you get a lot of people in your 20s. It's almost like a designer handbag, isn't it? You know, I'm going for my Botox and my fillers. And, you know, they're starting out really young in their 20s and, and I, I guess sort of telling themselves that this is preventative somehow. 
I mean, do you think there is uh, an age where that's not recommended? I think it's a difficult question to answer. So obviously the legal yeah. standard in the UK is to get cosmetic treatments, you need to be at least 18, right? So there's nothing to exclude patients in their 20s from getting or seeking out botulinum toxins if they wish to. Realistically, do you really need botulinum toxin in your early mid 20s? Probably not. Um, I know it's hard to make a blanket statement about something like that. Um, but you know, I I very much sort of um, subscribe to Dr. Chen's philosophy that it's more about holistic approach to anti-aging. And when you're in your 20s, things like skincare and sun protection are going to be much more important, make much more of a difference further down the line than botulinum toxin treatments. Um, I mean, having said that, I know there are different sort of intrinsic, extrinsic factors that will contribute to someone's quality of skin. Mm -hmm. So you can be like my mom and be blessed genetically and be well into your 50s and not a single line in your face. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I've, I've seen people who are quite young who do have really, really strong muscles and they yes. do start seeing those deep lines coming in, even in their 20s. And it does really it bothers them. Yeah, um, and I wouldn't you know, I wouldn't say no to, to doing a treatment for them. Um, so it, it is very much a case by case basis. But um, as Dr. Chen said, I think, you know, you shouldn't just be thinking about botulinum toxin as your primary anti-aging tool. There's so many other things to do before then. And it's best to start when like 20s are the perfect time to start doing all those things. Yeah, protecting your skin. Now, here's an interesting one. Uh, I'm going to put this one to you first, Dr. Chen. It's just something I noticed recently. This is new research that found um, basically brain scans in people who had Botox injections showed they had altered brain activity when they were reading facial expressions. And the hypothesis was that by paralyzing the muscles, it meant that the, the signaling to your brain is being disrupted. <laughs> what do you make of that? Um, I mean, to be completely honest, I don't know if we can draw i don't think we can necessarily yeah. draw any conclusions from that bit of research but what is interesting is how um affect you know basically altering our ability to make certain facial expressions and how that can affect someone's social interactions mm -hmm. with people because i'm aware of um you know for example they say they say that if you so when you're happy when you feel happy you smile and mm -hmm. if you force yourself to smile, that in turn can also make you feel happy. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in a similar way, so with frowning, for example, people who frown a lot, either they, um, you know, if, if people are angry or they're sad or they're stressed, they, they might frown. But if they do frown a lot, they, that might make them feel angry or sad. So mm -hmm. my experience has been that the, the, clients that I've had um who had very strong frown muscles who I've done the treatment for they always feel much happier oh. once they've had this area treated and it's relaxed and they can't frown anymore they just it makes them feel happier because they can't frown anymore so it that's can that, that's kind of maybe the opposite of what the um study has has found and this is all you know anecdotal evidence mm -hmm. um but I think there is definitely something about affecting your facial expressions and how that can affect how you feel. Yeah. yeah. And in turn, how it can affect how other people perceive you when you're talking to someone. So maybe, for example, if you're talking to a friend and they're going through some really sad times and you can't frown, maybe they will perceive you as being not very um, empathetic, for example, that might mm -hmm. affect mm -hmm. your social interactions in, in a negative way. But at the same time, if by you um, not frowning as much, if, if that makes you feel happier, maybe that is a good thing. Um, so I, I think we have to take this kind of thing with a pinch of salt. Research is research. Whether you can apply it in real life, it's often difficult to say. Um, yeah. But another example is, for example, when we do the toxin of the um, crow's feet area. Mm -hmm. It sometimes can make your smile seem less genuine because you can't crease the eyes. So for some people, that may be an issue. Mm -hmm. You know, if mm -hmm. for people who smile a lot, for example, if then their smile comes across as being less genuine, yeah. that might affect how the people perceive them. But it's all these things that's quite, I find all that stuff really fascinating. It is. Um, 
but it's not necessarily easy to prove and it's yeah. not the same for everyone. And it is, it's just getting that balance, isn't it? So that you um, you can get a little bit of relaxation, but that you're still looking like you. Um, and I guess that's all about experience and technique with the, with the practitioner. Um, Dr. Emmeline, what do you make of that research that Botox could alter our brain activity? Wish it would alter mine for the better, but that's wishful thinking. I, I love this topic. I am endlessly fascinated by it. Um, I actually wrote a paper last year for the Aesthetics Journal about the use of botulinum toxin treatments in depression and kind of exploring what the potential underlying mechanisms could be. Um, so it's a lot of what Dr. Chen's already like summarized very beautifully. Um, but the most commonly proposed mechanism of how this could affect your mood um, is something called the facial feedback hypothesis. So it's a theory that Darwin actually first described in the 19th century, where he stated that feelings could be affected by facial expression. Um, so basically what the, the theory says is that um, making an expression with your face can kind of increase the intensity of an emotion and inhibiting a facial expression could decrease it. So there have been um, articles and research that's been done that have shown that depressed mood is correlated to corrugator activity, which are the muscles here. Now that's correlation, it doesn't prove anything necessarily, but the idea is that, you know, I think we've all experienced this when we're stressed and we're worried. I mean, I instantly, I can feel that, that tension there. I start frowning. Um, and so sort of constantly molding your face into these expressions of concern and worry leads to negative emotions. Um, and I think there is, there has been some research that shows that you do have afferent sensory nerves, somatic nerves that synapse with connections in the amygdala. So that's the emotional processing center of the brain. So nerves um, from those corrugator muscles um, and that overactivity, you know, in of the amygdala is associated with negative emotions and, and depression. So there's lot, there's lots of interesting little pieces mm -hmm. of research being done to kind of look at this. I think it's likely that it's a combination of all those things. I think that, you know, the biochemical uh, signals or the feedback um, from the, the muscles to the brain, that's definitely one aspect of it. But also psychologically, you know, there's a lot our, our brain is so powerful and there's such a strong connection between between our feelings and emotions and the the, the physical kind of manifestation of of things in the body so you know if you um if you feel like you look good and you feel confident um then it makes you feel happier it's kind of quite obvious when you think about it like that and like you said the feedback that you get from other people how other people perceive you if you're not frowning anymore they'll be more smiley and then also when people look in the mirror and they're not frowning back at themselves they feel much better so it's, it's all of those factors combined so um so i think there is a lot more to Botox than just removing a couple of wrinkles. There's definitely yeah. a lot more to it. I, I think my kids will be sending me every three months now if, if they watch this in the hope that I might just lighten up. <laughs> Well, but, you know, a lot of people get tension headaches from yeah. stress, from, you know, like doing that in front of the computer or mm -hmm. the screens. And the, these muscles can become quite tight and, and actually lead to headaches. So for those kind of people, having toxin treatment actually can relieve the headaches, um, even for certain types of migraine. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's a, it is quite a therapeutic um drug as it were but it needs to be used properly and it needs to be used by someone who knows what they're doing and treating the appropriate things i think to use it purely just to get rid of some wrinkles long term without considering the um you know other other side effects or the long-term effects of it and, and what it is you're treating that that's not right but in the right hands you know botulinum toxin is is a great tool that that we can add to our to our toolkit to help with lots of things. And Dr. Emmeline, you know, we've, we've talked mainly about the pros actually, but I mean, what's your overall feeling about Botox as, as an aesthetic treatment? And do you think it's something that we will still be using 10 years down the line? Um, so overall feeling is pretty overwhelmingly positive. Um, I see the impact that these treatments have on my patients every single day. Um, it's 
actually it's such a pleasure to get a new brand new um botulinum toxin patient into clinic because it's it's nice to go on that journey with them to reassure them talk them through it um i can see you know that there's still sometimes a bit of stigma nerves holding people back um and again as as we've kind of summarized tonight when these treatments are appropriately delivered they can have a massive positive impact that's beyond just something that on the surface is purely cosmetic you know it can really make people feel so much better so much more self-confident um and i absolutely think we'll still be doing these treatments 10 years down the line you know there's nothing that can replicate what botulinum toxin does i know there's always um something trending on tiktok or in the news this is botox in a bottle you know this is the new skincare thing right that's gonna nothing nothing does what botulinum toxin does so i cannot imagine us not doing these treatments in 10 years yeah, Dr. Chen, do you agree? Do you think in the decades to come, we'll look back and laugh at the fact that we used to freeze our faces or or do you think it'll be around for some time to come? No, I think it will always be around, but I think how we use it will gradually change a bit over time and people's percep perception of it will slightly change. I mean, you know, don't forget, there are lots of medical uses for botulinum to toxin as well. And that those indications were, you know, it was used for much longer prior to it being used for cosmetic reasons like for it for for medical purposes and those uh for those indications you know tox the the botulinum toxin will definitely stick around um and for me i will always have it in my toolkit to to use when appropriate and it's not just about relaxing the muscles for for treating a few wrinkles it's also you know it can be used for treating um teeth grinding um for excessive sweating and uh, people who have really tight muscles in the shoulders and calves you know it, it is used in a lot of the, the asian um clients they want to reduce the the, the bulk of the muscles in the shoulders and calf you know calf slimming um and also in the medical well for medical purposes people who have um, spasticity in their muscles um the, the toxin can be used to relax those muscles so they're like dr emeline said there's nothing else in the market that can relax muscle as well as botulinum toxin can um and you know whatever indication you use for as long as it is appropriate for that particular patient or client um and it gives them the good result then then I think it's appropriate and it's the right thing to do. Okay, well, thank you very much to both of you. Uh, really good to have you involved, Dr. Emmeline, as well. And I hope to see you both back on the channel very soon. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you so much. I hope you found that discussion helpful. I always love to hear your thoughts. Do you use anti-wrinkle injections? If so, how often? And do you like to minimize all movement in your forehead or go for a softer approach like me where you're just targeting a particular area with a very small amount? For what it's worth, my take on Botox is that it's a great tool for preventing and minimizing lines. I do think it's important to not overdo it so you don't end up losing your muscles. And that's why I like to keep a bit of movement um, and leave longer gaps between treatments. Next time on the channel, I'll be taking a look at the much hyped number seven Future Renew range set by the scientists behind it to include game changing peptides that prompt the skin to repair some of the main signs of aging. Where have we heard that before? Well, I've picked up a bottle of the serum and I'm gonna have a look at the ingredients, the reviews and the research behind it and report back on whether this new range stands up to the hype and how it compares to some other leading peptide-based skincare products. For now, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.